Well, thank you. Thank you for the, the invitation as well. So yes, loosely I will talk to you about anti-biofilm uh, technology. I think is what I really want to echo or, or some of Glenn's points and especially in the, in the context of small molecule therapeutic development, we are much better, obviously, at the uh, <coughs> bench to business transition and not very good at the business to bedside transition. That's a world much better left to uh, the big pharmaceutical companies. So, <coughs> and I'd also like to echo one of Jim's points that the idea is usually less important than the team in the market. I think that's also very true in terms of developing small molecule therapeutics and, and where you're going to position them. So today <laughs> I'll tell you some vignettes about some, some things we're doing, but I'm a, I'm a chemist. So I put atoms together one atom at a time, and it turns out that's actually pretty hard <laughs> to do. And I've spent most of my career training how to do that learning how to do that. I spent the beginning of my independent career proving that I could do that. And now I have time to think about why I do that, right? <clears throat> and so this has been pretty nice for me and it's been great to be at the University of Utah because this is really a sandbox for a, for a medicinal chemist. I mean, we have so many people doing great things on this campus. And so the, the, the vignettes I'll tell you about today kind of stem around um, Technologies developed from conversations between myself, Dustin Williams, and orthopedics, as well as Lou Barrows in the Department of Pharmacy and, and Toxicology. And really, I'd like to illustrate this along the lines of how we take some interesting academic ideas from these academic conversations, how we generate proof of concept data, how that proof of concept gets turned into an initial business idea, and then how we may actually see an endpoint to making that clinically relevant in terms of a, a small molecule therapeutic. So one of the areas I'm getting more and more convinced that I need to work on is antibiotic development um, in terms of small molecule therapeutics. And that is because the, the amount of discovery that's going on in big pharma is, is negligible. And it's at a time when we need it most. So if we look at the bottom bar in the heyday of antibiotic discovery in the 1980s, we were turning out 16 new antibiotics every five years. That has dwindled to the last 10 years being kind of four antibiotics, and none of those antibiotics are new antibiotics, right? They're derivatives of penicillin, et cetera, et cetera. And so the discovery and the innovation in antibiotic development really has, has dwindled to a point where we're in trouble. Um, <clears throat> we need to figure that out. And so <clears throat> along with other researchers here at the university, we've started thinking about how to find new new antibiotics and and what arenas would new antibiotics be particularly useful in and one of the the areas that we've settled upon are biofilms so we're we're use i'll tell you in a second about a traditional antibiotic uh, approach to planktonic bacteria but we're also very interested in the development of, of molecules against biofilms. And so these are incredibly problematic in medical devices, obviously with chronic infections, also with, with topical wound management and diabetic foot ulcers and stuff like that. So a lot of conversations with orthopedic surgeons at, at the VA hospital, as well as people who treat a lot of, of chronic infected topical wounds has led us to think about developing new antibiotics for these type of microbial communities, which are very different than, than normal microbial communities that we think about. And so we've developed some compounds initially from <clears throat> essentially just designing them uh, from the bottom up. And that is to think about compounds like squalamine that are well known to kill bacteria. They're, they're very good at killing bacteria, very, very potent at doing that. Um, we've taken some design principles from that, and we can overlay, for example, norspermidine architecture, which allows us to disperse biofilms. So recent discoveries that suggest norspermidine is actually an endogenous trigger for biofilm dispersal. Um, and then we asked ourselves, can we combine 
those two kind of principles to develop new molecules that can both disperse and kill microbial biofilms. And that's actually very important to treating them uh, clinically. You not only want to kill the bugs that are in that biofilm, but you actually want to get the biofilm dispersed in the matrix out of there. And so <clears throat> we've developed a number of new compounds. And I think is what I want to point out is that, you know, the first five or 10 of these compounds are kind of the the academically interesting compounds, the proof of concept compounds that say, okay, we can do this. And it takes about 200 more compounds to really kind of vet the basic proof of concept, the principle that these compounds, for example, can kill bacteria, they can dis disperse biofilms, and that they don't kill mammalian cells, okay? So it takes a lot of compounds to fine tune the activity of these. And so we've ended up at a series of compounds that are very potent at killing bacteria, uh, minimum inhibitory concentrations in the half microgram to 16 microgram per mil. They're generally not cytotoxic to mammalian cells. And in the picture at the bottom, we see these are biofilms, communities of bacteria grown on stainless steel coupons. And compared to vancomycin, for example, this compound CZ99 very efficiently cleans that surface and disperses the bacteria off that surface, okay? So we have a new class of compounds that, that can disperse and kill bacteria in, in a biofilm phenotype. And we spent some time also with innovation here at the U developing animal models for these type of chronic biofilm related infections like diabetic foot ulcers. And so these are results just from, from a pig model that we've, we've developed where we use biofilms as initial inocula. And in the top left corner, it really just illustrates if we treat an open pig wound with MRSA, for example, a healthy pig is actually very much able to clear that infection. However, in the bottom left corner, if we treat with biofilms initially, we've developed methods to actually inoculate these wounds as biofilms, thus kind of recapitulating the chronic infection of a, of a diabetic foot ulcer, we see that we can't clear that infection and those bugs remain. And then in the bottom right, we can show that our compounds very efficiently still are able to disperse and kill these biofilms. Okay. <clears throat> the second class of compounds I want to tell you about are just, <clears throat> we've developed some new ribosomal inhibitors. So this is a, a very vetted target for antibiotic design. However, if you see in the orange, we have a compound, the first compound ever demonstrated to bind to the P side of the ribosome and inhibit protein synthesis selectively, okay? And <clears throat> the point of that is that if we can prove all the things about this small molecule that you need to prove, that it's safe, that it's efficacious, et cetera, et cetera, this lays the groundwork for a completely new class of antibiotics, okay, that we use. And so we want to do that. Again, the first 10 to 15 molecules in this series help you kind of prove the academic point that this is the first selective compound that inhibits the P-site, but then it takes another 200 molecules to really convince somebody that these molecules are interesting, okay? So it takes another 200 compounds for us to show that we can maintain potency against inhibiting the ribosome, to show that we can increase the selectivity and thus cytotoxicity, and that these are <coughs> active in animals and that we can expand the spectrum of activity, okay? And so, <clears throat> not to go through the data, but that CZ02198, that's the 198th compound in the series, right? It's about 200 compounds to be able to, to prove the stuff that you need to prove about small molecule therapeutics, that it's worth developing. And so who makes these molecules? Well, we've been very fortunate here at the University of Utah to have established a synthetic and medicinal chemistry core. It's a reboot of something Glenn had developed here uh, a while ago. And we've been able to recruit Paul Sebahar and Chad Testa in the back, who are phenomenally talented individuals at helping us make those 200 molecules and vet those 200 molecules in, in assays that we're interested in. And so now that we have the proof of concept with these molecules, for the purpose of this audience, this is really what I want to, to show is that in small molecule therapy, therapeutic development, we're very good at the discovery and preclinical side of things, right? It takes 
is Glenn had mentioned a lot of money to get a small molecule to the clinic about 1.5 billion dollars nowadays and we, we can't do that and so really I think the goal for us as academic people is to get this to the FDA IND stage of development and then hopefully partner that with big pharma and we we think of this in terms of in the beginning <clears throat> the University of Utah National Institute of Health funding this research, then there's a gap, right, where we convince the FDA that this molecule is actually safe enough to put into humans, okay, before we can get it to be partnered, before Big Pharma is interested in it. And that, of course, is what they call the, the classic valley of death for drug discovery. And the big question is, how do we fund that valley of death, right? Because that's past NIH, SBIR money, but it's pre- kind of big pharma investment money. And so that's where we step in to build small companies to raise the capital to generate the data for those INDs. And we've been very fortunate to, to start a company based around this technology uh, funded by Clark Capital Partners, largely in the, the initial seed round. This company, Curza, now has uh, Ryan Davies as the CEO, Todd Kennard is our executive vice president, and these guys are absolutely phenomenal. This, these programs would not be successful without these two individuals. There you can see Ryan on TV telling about how superbugs are going to kill the world, and you know I'm glad you have people that want to go out and do that stuff. I'm a chemist, right? So that's part of the team. Uh, <clears throat> they've been very good at, at raising money, an initial seed round of $4.2 million to give us the data that we need to, to essentially develop a sophisticated data package to then go a, do a $22 million Series A round that then will hopefully get us to an FDA IND filing, okay, and is what we see in this landscape right now is that that kind of IND phase one inflection point, we're seeing deals in the kind of $150 million plus licensing uh, plus royalties uh, for these type of small molecule therapeutics right now. So that's the ultimate flow through this, and we need these business guys to help us do that because, again, we're a chemist. I'm a chemist. So anyway, I just wanted to illustrate kind of the process we're going through to get some of these antibiotics hopefully to the clinic in the next one to two years. So thank you, guys. Thank you.